everyone and welcome back. I have determined that I need more waistcoats in my wardrobe and honestly there's no better place to start learning about historical tailoring than with waistcoats. I have two in my collection of antiques which are perfect examples of the extremes of the two ends when it comes to complexity and construction. One is an 1890s summer waistcoat and the other is a 1904 evening waistcoat for formal wear. So they both have completely different techniques in them and are going to be a great introduction to how to actually apply the basics of tailoring because rather than go into a 101 series where I give you all of the stitches, all of the fabrics, all of the layers, all of the placements, so many details that just become overwhelming, I want to try and keep this as simple as possible and applicable as possible because the really amazing thing about tailoring is the fact that there's not one right way to do things. There's all sorts of different options and choices you have along the way that work best with your fabric and what your expectations are. But what that also means is that it just ends up feeling incredibly complex when you go to start learning about it. So today's goal is going to be making all of this far less confusing and far less overwhelming for everyone. I know I get a lot of questions about historical tailoring and I see a lot of questions posted online from some very overwhelmed people about where do I even begin with this? The instructions that I have in different places tell me different things and there's so many options. So I'm going to walk you through why I'm choosing to do things the way that I am rather than just give you a whole bunch of jumbled of information. First things first, we're going to take a look at the two waistcoats. The summer waistcoat, like I said, is from likely the early 1890s. This is a really classic style that goes from the late 1880s well into the 19 teens. And as you might note, there is very little difference between the fact that this is a men's waistcoat and what would be a women's waistcoat of the same style. Basically, there'd be more into that dart. So you get a little bit of a curvier style. And at most, there might be a bit more of a fitted back rather than one that relies on the buckle and strap to pull it in. That's really going to be the only difference here. But this waistcoat has some really great features despite the fact that it is so incredible incredibly simple in its construction. You might first notice the fact that it's entirely out of white cotton. It's meant to be washable, which also means that there are no internal layers to this. There's no canvas, anything going on inside. It's also almost entirely machine stitched. I do really want to point out the buttons, however. This is one of my favorite features of washable waistcoats like this. They have to have the buttons be removable because they can't go through the laundry in the same way. So they actually do little eyelets and plackets and will use rings or safety pins to hold the buttons in place. So I'll be showing how to do that today as well as teaching you about the basics of welted pockets and one of the techniques that we can use in order to deal with attaching the backs to the fronts, in this case with a single layer, which is a little bit different than most things give you instructions for. Moving on then to the evening waistcoat. This is a very formal piece. It's meant to be worn with a tailcoat. It is again a very universal style, though the inside of the pocket does have a tag that denotes who made it, who it was made for, and that it was made in 1904 specifically. This style with very few changes also manages from the 1880s through to the 19 teens. This has a lot more complication going on. Inside it has linen canvas. At one area in the chest it does have two layers, so we'll get to learn a little bit about pad stitching in its most basic form. We're not doing shaping, we're not doing all of the complicated stuff with pad stitching, we're just essentially quilting these two layers together for a little bit of added strength. So we're going to learn about how to apply a canvas inside of a basic waistcoat like this. We're also going to see a back being done with a lining so we can see that different construction and the welted pockets are done in a very similar way just with a little bit more hand stitching a little bit more finesse so the whole thing is going to be a more elevated version of construction but that gives us two very dramatic ends of the spectrum of different types of techniques basically meaning this is as complicated as really you're going to see almost any waistcoat get but they're both very typical in their construction i know this whole project can still seem incredibly complicated there are a lot of parts a lot of textiles, a lot of stitches, a lot of options that we have on these things. And I too can get overwhelmed by these projects and all the different parts that I have to keep track of when I'm going and purchasing things like buttons and buckles, linings, and all sorts of different fabrics, trying to keep track of the patterns that I'm working on. Because though I'm not going to be talking about the patterns today, these will eventually be released as commercial patterns, hopefully later in this year, along with a whole lot of other tailoring patterns and a great deal of instructions. But it's taking a lot of organization for all of these projects, for my patterns, for my antiques. There's so much that I'm trying to keep track of. That's why I'm so happy that the sponsor for today's video is Milanote. 
Milanote is an amazing tool for organizing your projects, big or small. I am absolutely a visual thinker and struggle when my projects have an overwhelming number of parts to keep track of, all stored in different places. This way I can collect everything I need, pictures, links, research documents, in one place where I can organize them in a way that makes sense for my brain. This is my main project board. In here I have instructions, patterns, to-do lists, supplies, and more. All of the things I need to reference constantly. Then I can follow through to the details of the original where I keep lists of supply links as I'm shopping around for my options. It's especially easy with the web clipper extension and it instantly gives me a photo with each link so I can compare things side by side. Another subboard has all of my ongoing research, fashion plates, photos, even PDFs. I even put a rough pattern on here so I can take notes and draw out any changes as I go along so I don't forget what I need to fix later. There are over 100 templates to choose from if you don't know where to start and even a little bin off to the side where you can dump things to organize later. I'm so excited about sorting my projects out on Milanote. I can keep track of everything, update it as I go, and not have to scrounge around for a lost bit of information. I'm planning to upload all of the notes for my growing antiques collection as well, so I can have details, research, and photos available to share. Finally, Milanote is available for free with no time limit. Sign up using the link in the description and start your next creative project. And if you enjoy using Milanote, let me know down below in the comments. Thanks again to Milanote for sponsoring today's video and helping me manage all of the complicated parts of these projects. We're gonna first break down what goes into just these two waistcoats, which seems like it's going to be incredibly different, but I I promise you it's not. Starting with the main fabric. The only really important thing here is that you choose a fabric that is stable. You don't want something that is going to drape, you don't want something that is going to change shapes, and you don't want something that is incredibly heavy because then it's gonna get really bulky. So we want something in the mid to lighter weight range which is stable because if anything really defines tailoring, it's going to be that. It's not the fact that we're building up tons of layers. That's not always the case, obviously, by our projects today. It also used to be defined by the fact that we were taking measurements and making patterns and cutting things out based on those rather than draping on the figure like dressmaking did. But today we tend to work off of sewing patterns for most of our projects. So it's not as easily defined by that construction process anymore. Instead, it tends to be a matter of clothing that holds its shape hold some structure, doesn't flex and change, stretch and move and shift with the body. So that is what we want out of our main fabric. Now, that means it can be so many different types of fabric. Wool, I do find, is the easiest to work with because not only do you often find something in the mid-weight that is more stable, but it also responds well to heat and moisture, meaning that you can steam and press it into different shapes, which will become very useful when we have to deal with things like the lapels on the evening waistcoat. That is one of the features of the construction that is really important. There are plenty of other fabrics that can do this too, but it's just a matter of finding something that offers the stability that you need without being too bulky or without having any give whatsoever. The reason why I and so many others will generally steer you towards natural fibers is because they are much more predictable. So wool has very consistent attributes as to cotton, linen, and even silk. I don't recommend silk for the main fabric on these things until you've reached a point where you're really comfortable because that fabric just amplifies anything that isn't absolutely perfect. But when it comes to cotton, linen, and wool, they are pretty consistent in what you are going to get. Polyesters and other synthetics are perfectly fine to work with. They just have a much wider range of attributes. Depending on how polyester is extruded, it's going to give you a very different fabric. And that's not something that we're going to find in the listing. So if you can have it in your hand and you can work with it and check it, that's fine. But online, it's just really unpredictable. That doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just means that it's riskier and you are more likely to have problems that aren't your fault when it comes to trying to do this construction. So for today, I'm sticking with a wool for my evening waistcoat, but I'm going with a heavier linen, which is pretty stiff considering it's a linen, for the summer waistcoat. Again, the original is a cotton and it does very well with that. I just managed to find a linen that had a similar pattern that I really liked. As for the internals, the only thing that we're going to see inside of either of these is linen canvas. The point of linen canvas is stability. It keeps the shape. It does not stretch easily in any direction. It has a little bit of shift on the bias usually, but not too terribly much. It maintains its shape and will maintain the shape of the garment. It also doesn't fray easily. 
It's usually finer weave, pretty tightly packed, stiffened up sometimes with additional things like gum tragicanth added to help stiffen it, hence why it's not washable. This is what you need. If you cannot find or afford linen canvas, there are plenty of similar options in terms of cotton canvases out there. You can go with hemp canvases. There are even some wool options that I've come across from tailoring shops. It does not have to be linen. It's just more likely to have those specific attributes that we are looking for. Basically, you're looking for something that has a fine, tight weave that is mid-weight and it's very stiff. What I do not want you to go use is hair cloth, or for that matter, horse hair. So those are two different fabrics that I very often see used in tailoring. Horsehair was used historically in tailoring very commonly. It has horsehair running one way and then usually a cotton running the other way. So it is very stiff in one direction and completely crumples in the other, meaning that it does not offer stability. What it does offer is spring. So the places where horsehair is commonly used is for example, in the upper chest area. And this is there so that way as you slouch forward, it will prevent you from crumpling the front of your coat. This is a difficult fabric to work with because it is so picky, the directionality is very precise and you need to cover all of the edges so they don't work their way through the fabrics and stab you. Hence why the chest is a really popular place to utilize it because it works almost like a patch in that area. There are other places that it gets used but we're not going to get into the complication of that today. Just know that we are not using horse hair for today's purposes. You don't need it for most of the tailoring you're going to do. In fact, almost all of the antiques that I have coats for both men and women, waistcoats for both men and women, they don't have horse hair in them. They also don't have hair cloth. This is what you're going to more commonly see being sold for modern tailoring. It picks up in popularity around the 1920s and 1930s. In fact, some of the earliest advertisements for it by the Hymo brand, which is still the brand that sells it today, come from the 19 teens. And it is advertised at that time as being a replacement for the amalgamation of all of the other layers that generally go into these garments. So it is not something that was commonly used yet until we reach a point in tailoring where things become much more mass produced. It is not going to be found, therefore, in any of the 19th century garments or even early 20th century garments. It doesn't have the same stability as a linen canvas does, and it does not have the same spring and resistance that a horse hair does. It's meant to somewhat be in between, made out of goat hair, cotton, and sometimes wool. It will not give you the same effect as these other fabrics. And you still should finish off all your edges when you're working with it. And just honestly, in my opinion, it complicates historical tailoring more. It has its place in modern tailoring and I totally understand why it's there, but it is going to make your job more difficult when you are doing historical tailoring and attempting to get the same look and stability and consistency and feel of historical garments. It's just not going to do that for you because that's not its intention. So for today, stick with some sort of stable canvas. For the linings, most often we're dealing with cotton and silk. Cotton obviously on the washable one makes perfect sense. I just went with a plain white mercerized cotton, but so many plain cottons will do very well for this. Plain cottons also do very well for the pockets. Twill cotton is another great option for that as well. And very often, even in the fancier wool and silk waistcoats, you will find twill cotton being used in the pocketing. For the evening waistcoat, I have two different silks that I'm working with, a black silk twill that goes on the exterior of the back, and then a white silk on the interior. The original has a twill. I wasn't able to find a white silk twill that was stable enough. I ended up going with a very lightly corded white silk instead. But anything basically one step down from the stiffness of taffeta is about what we're going for here. You just don't want something really drapey like a satin charmeuse, something like that. You just want it to, again, afford stability and consistency consistency to make your life easier and to make the garment more consistent. So the reason though we are going with white on the interior rather than using that black throughout is because the black will bleed when you sweat. It doesn't matter if it's a modern fabric, it's still going to bleed onto your white shirt. So we want to stick to light colors for the lining in order to prevent that from happening. That is a very consistent thing I see on a lot of waistcoats from the era, using a lighter color or a plainer fabric on the interior so that way you don't have to worry about that issue. In terms of other supplies, you'll want to have very specific threads for this. Most of the summer waistcoat is all machine stitched. Whatever machine thread you prefer to use is perfectly fine for this. When it comes to hand stitching, I generally prefer to use silk for most of it. It, just because it's easier to stitch with. It's not necessary, but I find it easier. So I will use a 50 weight, which is the very thin fine,
line type for when I'm, say, stitching in a lining or something that's not going to be under high stress. And I will use a heavier 30 weight silk for things like buttonhole stitches or other places where there is going to be some pull, say, at the edges of the pockets. In the interior, I actually end up using linen thread for the construction today because that is the closest thing I can find to some of the heavier weight mercerized cotton that they would have historically used. It's not unavailable today by any means, it's just not something that I keep around, so the linen is closer in weight to what the cotton they had is. It's just going to preferably be a little bit heavier weight than the machine thread that you're using. But the most important specialty thread above all else is going to be a basting thread. This I cannot recommend investing in enough. It is not exactly expensive, it comes in very large spools, and it's a cotton thread that is meant to snap very easily, meaning that it is only used for temporary purposes, it's very easy to remove, and that is going to make your life a lot easier because we are going to be doing some basting to hold some of these complex layers together just because that's easier than dealing with pins trying to stab you the entire time. <laughs> when it comes to buttons, I am using buttons that have metal shanks on the back. However, buttons with holes in them are perfectly fine. You just might want to add a thread shank to those. So with all of that in mind, let's dig in and start with our simpler summer waistcoat. There are two darts on each one of the fronts of this waistcoat. The first one is at the waist like you would expect. This is a pretty small dart since this is a men's style of waistcoat. The dart itself gets stitched up, cut open up till a certain point about where it starts being closer to an eighth of an inch than a quarter of an inch in seam allowance and then pressed open. There's also another dart up the neckline where the lapel will get stitched on. So that will help sort of keep it closer to the body. The larger dart that is down by the waist actually gets top stitched up both sides and around, which does not add strength. It's more for a visual aspect. There's a lot of top stitching on this waistcoat. There is no top stitching on the dart that is by the neck because obviously it won't be seen. The lapel will be folded over it. Then we can start working on the pockets. Because this is a patterned fabric, I'm going to try and match the welts up the best that I can. I do this simply by folding back the seam allowance at the bottom of the welt and then matching it up on top of the fabric first. So this allows me to make sure that I have the line that I'm going for matched up to the fabric and can work it out that way. I will pin that in place and then I will fold down the top portion of the welt and move the pins to be just on the seam allowance. It doesn't necessarily come out absolutely perfect, especially if your fabric is prone to moving back and forth, but it's pretty darn close. I'm then going in and basting this in place. Yes, you can just use the pins and then stitch it down on the machine. I find because of the pattern on this, I want it to be very precise, so I'm basting it down. Same thing goes with the back portion of the pocketing. I'm making sure that that is half an inch exactly from the line that I'm going to be stitching on the welt, because that's the size of the opening that I want, and I'm basting that into place so it also doesn't shift around. Once the basting is in, I can go in and stitch both of those lines down, stopping before we get to the seam allowance at either end. In fact, I prefer to stop just a little bit short on both of them rather than go over. Once those are stitched, it's time to open up the pocket. This I will do from the back side where I will draw out exactly where I want to make the cut. Sometimes the pocket has moved around a little bit in terms of the exact placement, so I'll draw a little V at both ends and cut that open and then cut a long line down the middle directly between the two lines of stitching. I want to make sure that I'm not cutting into the seam allowance. It's okay if your seam allowance is more than half of the width of the opening. It's not a problem. You just want to make sure that it's pulled out of the way so that way you aren't trimming that back or trimming the V's into the seam allowance. From there, it's time to do a little bit of ironing. The pocketing gets folded down and pressed that way. The welt gets folded up and pressed open. Then add the other side of the pocketing, the front portion, onto the leftover edge of the welt and the whole thing will then get tucked down inside. I have to double check that I'm folding it in the correct spot and everything with the pocketing matches up, but once that's the case I'll fold in the two ends as well. I like to leave the welt just a smidge larger on each end because that will help cover up the opening of the pocket that we're going to deal with later. So if it extends just a little bit further than where you stitched it, that's okay, like a very minute amount, one or two millimeters. I'm then going ahead and basting across this pocket welt as well just to hold it really secure and then it gets 
two lines of top stitching along the top edge. There is a lot of top stitching on this waistcoat. This is also a decorative feature of the time. There are tailored pieces from this era that have seven or eight lines of top stitching. There is another line of top stitching that is done at the bottom of the welt, just below where the welt is seamed on, going through just the one layer of pocketing there, not through the back layer that gets folded up and out of the way. So this holds everything nicely in place for now. I'm not gonna deal with the ends just yet. First, I'm going to close up the pocket. Hopefully the two pieces of pocketing match up at the bottom. It's okay if they don't, just make sure that they lay flat more so than matching up the exact edges. And I stitch all the way up to the tops, including managing to catch that little triangular V area at the two ends to hold that back out of the opening. Then I can go in and top stitch down the two ends of the welt. Again, lining this up to make sure that it's keeping the pattern consistent. It again uses two lines of top stitching about a quarter of an inch apart in order to hold it down. And this goes through all of the layers to make sure that it is nice and secure and won't cause stress on the fabric when you put things in your pockets. Obviously nothing too heavy in this case. Then it's time to move on to the lapel. This waistcoat has a lining fabric for the under portion of the lapel. So that's what I'm stitching on here. It will extend back off the neck because it will eventually be a collared lapel. So it needs to make sure that it extends as far as the lining. But as for the front, it all gets folded towards the thinner fabric, towards that lining fabric. And then it's time to start working on the actual lining. Because it's a summer waistcoat and buttons are removable, we need an extra little placket over the top protected from the shirt. So first up, just folding over an edge twice and top stitching. This little placket will then sit roughly on top of the lining. It is pretty imprecise on the original. They're in two pretty different locations. I am choosing to keep it out of the way of the seam allowance along the front edge. It will just be caught up in the seam allowance along the bottom, which is where I'm headed to next, making sure that the lining and the facings attach together and line up correctly. I added a little bit of extra seam allowance to both of those when I cut them out, just to be sure that I could fidget them around as need be. When it comes to the front facing as well as the lapel facing, those get seamed together and no, the patterns don't match at all. Then I can actually pin that portion to the lining. Again, this is done in a very quick way. This is not done really precisely. A lot of times, as you'll see in the next one, we will hand stitch in the lining fabric later after doing the facings, but this is a really quick and easy way. So once we have all of the linings and the facings attached, we can then actually stitch them around the exterior of the body. We're going to leave both the shoulders and the side seams open. So the armhole, as well as the entire lapel and front line and down around the bottom is all stitched up. I'm sticking to quarter inch seam allowances for almost all of this. There are a few places where I cut it with half inch just in case something needs to be fidgeted with, but I usually trim those down as I'm doing the construction and I'm sure that it's situated correctly. Quarter inch is just a lot easier to work with than chunky amounts. Once everything is clipped, folded right side out and pressed, it's then time to stitch the two fronts together up at the back of the neck where the collar is. And then I start top stitching around all of the edges. The armhole gets just one line of top stitching a quarter inch in, but the rest of the body around all of the edges that are finished get top stitched right at the edge as well as a quarter inch in from that. Again, the side seams and the shoulder seams are left out and raw. There is a little bit of clipping that is done at the side seam because of the way the bottom comes up and around in this particular waistcoat, but not in all. So the top stitching is going to make sure that nothing rolls back and forth and is a really common feature in a lot of tailoring of this era. Once we have the sewing machine, we might as well go in and make sure that everything is nice and stable because it doesn't take much time and it offers a decorative style. Then it's time to move on to the back of the waistcoat. This is a single layer, so there are facings. Starting off with the facing that is down at the hem. I've pressed back the top edge of the facing and then I'm going to stitch it along the bottom of the waistcoat, flip it around, press it, and then top stitch. This will get caught up in the side seams a little bit along with the rest, as will the neck facing up at the top. So this is less to cover anything up, but more to add strength to that area. That's an area with a lot of abrasion, a lot of wear and tear. So this one isn't going to offer the same finishing of the edge as the bottom will, but it's still going to be useful in the long run. So everything else is still left raw around all the edges with the exception of that bottom where the facing is, which you can see 
sort of curves up around because that's the style of the waistcoat, not always the case. I then need to add the straps. In this case, they press back the seam allowance and top stitch around all of the edges rather than stitching it together and folding it back out. I think this does make it a little bit easier so long as your fabric is friendly to pressing easily. Those then get stitched onto the back with just three lines of quick stitching to hold them into place, leaving the ends free so that way the buckle can adjust pretty far in and out. And it's time to start attaching the fronts to the back. This is an unusual process because it is single layer, so we're still going to treat it with the seams towards the inside, just like we normally would for both the shoulders and the side seams. The neck we're getting to in just a second. Those seams are just going to be left raw for the moment until we deal with a couple of other steps. First, we need to deal with that neckline. The lapel that is the lining side, the underside, is folded back and pressed at the seam allowance, and then I'm going to fold back and press the back fabric as well, and just barely by a hair overlap those two and top stitch them together. This is kind of a weird construction, but that's the way they did it. From there, I'm then able to start folding over the extra seam allowance, making sure that I've trimmed everything back to quarter an inch with the exception of the seam allowance that is going over everything. So the lapel out of the visible fabric is left to half an inch and the lining fabric of the front is left at half an inch. Everything else is trimmed back to a quarter inch and so I'm able to just fold it over and under and then top stitch it one more time. So we're simply felling down these seams in order to finish them off. We're going to be doing a very similar thing to the side seams as well where I'm trimming back all of the fabric with the exception of the lining for the front and I'm folding that over the quarter inch seam allowance and top stitching it down. Remember that this waistcoat is intended to be worn underneath of a garment so we don't have to worry about that part being visible. The very last thing I have to deal with is the back portion of the armholes. There's a tiny little facing that gets stitched onto this. The loose edge pressed back and the whole thing will be clipped, folded, pressed, and then top stitched down just like I did for the bottom facing as well. So that little bit there, sort of like a bias tape finishing, is done around the curve part of that. From there, the only thing left for me to do is deal with the buttons and the buttonholes. So for the buttonholes, these are pretty standard keyhole buttonholes. As I mentioned before, refer back to my very lengthy video on buttonholes if you want to know more about that. The buttons, however, are put in through eyelets. These are very simple eyelets. I'm using an awl to open it up and using a whip stitch to hold the threads back. We don't want to cut a hole because things will start to fray. We want those threads to add some extra strength where we're pushing them back, and we don't need to do something complicated like a buttonhole stitch here. That's just going to encourage the stitches to wear out faster. So we're just going to do a really quick whip stitch. The button shanks will be inserted through the eyelets and held onto the back by way of cottering pins or safety pins or jump rings, whatever really strong metal option you choose that is easily removable for laundering. In this case, the buckle is not stitched on the back because again, laundering purposes. So I'm just stabbing it through the straps temporarily. Since I'm working on black fabric, I'm going in with a chalk pencil. You can use a piece of triangle tailor chalk as well, but I just find this is a little bit more precise when dealing with things like pocket openings. The welting process is going to be very similar to the previous one for most of the steps. We're starting off by laying in the welt portion along the bottom of the opening, basting this into place, and then we'll go in and baste the pocketing above it pocket opening on this one is a little bit narrower because the welt itself is a little bit narrower, which is just a style option. It doesn't really change anything, but you might note the fact that the seam allowances are overlapping on this because the opening is just over a quarter of an inch, so it's not a big deal as long as they aren't going further than the stitch lines. So I just need to make sure that the two lines of stitching for both the welt and the pocketing don't overlap each other and be just fine. Once I have those two lines of stitching, same thing as before, stopping just before we reach the edge. And this is a great example of why sometimes you'll need to remove the basting as you go rather than at the very end. I'm going to go through and cut down the center and cut the two little V's at the end to make sure that we get into those corners and have a nice rectangular opening. As before, we're going to press the pocketing downwards, same thing, and then the welt itself will be pressed upwards with the seam allowance open. There are many ways to do welts, but this is a very standard construction method, so you see it on a lot of examples. The next step is the one part that is different. In this case, we are going to be adding a little bit of linen canvas. This is exactly the size of the welt as it's finished, which will also help us know exactly where to fold the fabric. I'm just going to fold the ends over, fold the top edge 
edge over, pin everything into place, and then as usual, baste everything down so that way it stays where it needs to. Because we have a little bit of hand stitching and machine stitching to get through, and I don't want things to move around while we're still trying to anchor everything down. The pointed end does sometimes require a little bit of extra folding just to get everything clean and precise, so there's more than just one fold there. Then everything gets basted into place because we have so many different parts that are shifting around and I don't feel like pins can really hold it very well. There is one line of top stitching that goes up the side across the top and back down again. This is done really close up to the edge. The original of this waistcoat does have a rick rack, really narrow, that is hand stitched around a lot of the edges. Couldn't find a good rick rack and I didn't really care for adding a second line of top stitching. Now that I've done that, I need to add the other side of the pocket bag. In this case, I'm going to be hand stitching it in rather than machine stitching it on like I did with the previous waistcoat. So again, this is sort of just an amplified, slightly more precise version of the previous one. So once that gets the top edge seam allowance folded down and pinned into place, I will then go in and fell it down. So just a really small tiny felling stitch because this is a little bit more of a stress area I am doing this with the slightly heavier silk thread rather than the really lightweight I don't need it to be invisible I need to make sure that it doesn't rip out but this is just going through the layers of the pocketing and and through the canvas I make sure that it doesn't come out the other side once that is taken care of I can then stitch the pocket bag closed going around the three sides of the pocket bag that are left open just like before making sure that I catch those little triangles that are now pressed back out of the opening in order to keep those anchored so now everything is in place and I can go ahead and remove the basting I'm not stitching down the ends just yet I am waiting until we have the canvas to anchor them to that so the canvas portion is most of the front it doesn't go all the way into the side seam but it does go all the way up into the shoulder seam and then there is a second piece that sits on top of the chest area I've offset it just slightly so I don't have too much bulk in the arm side and it is offset from the front as well this is just where it seems to be on the original and I'm going to be doing a stitch very similar to the basting stitch it's a little bit smaller on the chunk that I take with the stitch than the distance that I travel but it's essentially just a bit of a zigzag it's just not a really extreme one when I get to the top I take one stitch to get myself over far enough and then I work my way back down at the opposite angle. So you shouldn't have to move the piece back and forth in order to do pad stitching. This is done with it sitting on sometimes a curved surface in order to get the curve between the two layers, but in this case we just need a little bit of extra strength in that area so I don't have to worry about that. I am making sure that I anchor these stitches rather than using a knot so that way I don't end up with a whole bunch of tiny little knots that create bumps, but the whole thing gets pad stitched on that way. We don't have to worry about curves or anything crazy. This is a great way to introduce you to pad stitching with a lot less stress because no one will ever see this. It just needs to hold them together. I do want to note that you can do this by machine if you don't want to do hand stitching for whatever reason. There are plenty of originals in my collection where the machine stitching just goes back and forth or even does it in a circular pattern if we're trying to get curves on it. So machine stitching is fine here if you don't want to practice your pad stitching. Once that is done, it gets laid onto the front with the secondary layer towards the front and make sure that you've stayed clear of all the seam allowances around the edges, but this is going to give you your exact shape of your garment, hence why this canvas needs to be stable and it needs to be precise because this is your finished shape. Then we're going to base that into place. Again, I always find stitch basing much friendlier than pin basting because I don't have to leave all these pins in for the whole process. In fact, you have to do them to the outside so they don't get completely encased. But then I'm going to go in and start finishing off some of the edges like the arm side. This gets whipped down. This is done in a permanent thread, but I'm not going through to the exterior. So it's just the seam allowance to the canvas. And then I'm going along and top stitching, just like I did with the summer waistcoat. Once everything is folded back, we top stitch it down to make sure it's nice and secure. Then I can go in and stitch down the ends of the pocket welts. So in this case, it's just a felling stitch, pretty invisible along the edge. I'm just putting five or six tiny little stitches and making sure that I anchor both ends really well. So that way it's not likely, even if I stress the pocket by putting something in it, that these are going to come loose. So you can see from the inside there, both of the pocket welts stitched down, anchored well, and then it's time to move on to this really weird lapel situation. I'm starting off by stitching the lining of the lapel to the exterior portion of the lapel. So I'm basting these together because they need to be offset slightly. The lining sticks out just a little bit further because when I 
press these things, I want there to be an underlap to the edge, as you'll see. So I'm stitching between the two lines, so a little bit outside of where the wool's uh, stitch line is. Pulling the basting out so that way I can fold it right side out and press it. I'm starting off by pressing the lining portion up against the seam there, and then I fold it just a hair, just a millimeter or two further than where the stitch line is, and that will give me that underlap that means that the lining will never be visible. Next, it's time to put in more canvas. So the canvas sits into that fold, so it will sit on top of the seam allowance there, which is now hidden underneath of it, and it will get basted to just the lining fabric, because these still have to be separate along that edge. That lining fabric and canvas now gets stitched to the neckline of the front of the waistcoat. Then it's time to move on to the rest of the facings. So just like before, there is a front facing and a bottom facing, which have to be seamed together, and then they can get attached to that very weird lapel facing. This is going to take some pressing in order to get it into place. All of the waistcoats that I've examined do a very similar thing if they have a front that has a lapel on it. It just means you have to press and shrink and stretch and hope that your fabric and the pattern allow for that. But once all those facings are seamed together, I can then attach them to the front around the edges, again utilizing that canvas to make sure that everything lines up. I don't want to stitch on top of the canvas. This is not meant to fold into the seam allowances. I want to stitch just a millimeter away from that, preferably offsetting again the lining just a little bit further out so that way we continue to get that fold back by just a millimeter around all of the edges. Once I've trimmed the seam allowance like I need to in order to allow for the convex angles, I'm then going to make sure that everything turns as nicely as I can and press it into place, offsetting that lining and the facing just slightly. It will be top stitched down into place and held there, but still better if we can press it really well to begin with. I'm using a block of wood in order to allow it to cool properly, and then when it comes to that lapel area, this is where I'm going to be stretching and pulling to get it down and around that curve. It doesn't seem like it should go, but it does. It isn't too large of a seam allowance there. Most modern patterns won't have you do this because it's complicated, but the version that I will eventually put out will have this. Then I'm able to go and start top stitching around all of those edges that we've now finished. Just like the previous waistcoat, even with all this extra complication, we are still leaving just the side seams and the shoulder seams raw. So I'm top stitching up and around. I am stopping just shy of the very back. You'll note that I have not stitched the two fronts together at the lapels yet. The collar in back is going to get sort of uh, encased later. There's also a little extension that you'll notice on this side to allow for the buttons and buttonholes to overlap properly, but otherwise the top stitching very similar to what we just previously did. However, you'll note that the lining is not attached yet. Though these facings are in, the lining is not attached. So I need to pull those facings back and whip them down just like I did with the armhole. So everything is seam allowance whipped down to the canvas, making sure that I'm not going through to that external layer. Doing this in a permanent white thread after all, that would be really visible. And this allows me to really pull it back and stretch it and get it into place to make sure everything is held very, very smoothly, which is important when you're dealing with the complex curves around the neckline and around the fronts and all those facings pieces. This allows me to just be way more precise with the fabrics. The very last step before I put in the lining is to stitch down the lapel. Unlike the previous one that was held in by the way that's folded, this lapel needs a little bit of assistance to make sure that it doesn't try to roll itself back up again. So there's just a running stitch between the lining of the lapel and the body of the front. It stops before we get to the shoulder seam by about an inch and it stops right before the curved portion at the bottom. Then it is time to close everything up with the lining. And the nice thing about this is I can be really precise with how this lays out. I've added a little bit of extra seam allowance to those facings beyond the quarter inch just to make sure that I guarantee I have enough overlap. But the lining itself is done with a quarter inch seam allowance so that way I can get around all of those complex curves. That gets filled into place and then it is time to start moving on to the back will be done a little bit differently than our previous version. Because this is a fully lined back, I'm starting off by stitching the exterior and then folding the same allowance to one side and top stitching it. That's just a choice that they made. It adds a little bit of strength. The straps are also done a little bit differently where one edge is folded under and everything's folded on top of itself and I'm top stitching weirdly through all of the layers at once. This part isn't really important. There's lots of different ways that you can do the back straps. I think they just like the decorative elements of this. 
but it gets top stitched down just like the previous one did. The ends are left on this case because we will be stitching a permanent buckle on. Back lining is also seamed up. Yes, I'm using black thread on a white lining. I don't really care. <laughs> it won't be visible. Then it's time to start piecing the backs and the fronts together. The easiest way for me to do this is to lay down the back lining face up and then put the fronts on top. I'm going to pin and baste all of those seams together. I do have a variety of different seam allowances so that makes it a little bit confusing so don't worry too much about that aspect but I'm basting all of these layers together just at the side seams and the shoulder seams. Then I'm going to take the lining and lay that down and sandwich everything together, making sure that I keep the fronts out of the way. I'm going to baste around all of the edges that I need finished. The only part that's left open is up at the top of the neckline because that has a very different finishing technique. This I find is the easiest way for me to make sure that I don't accidentally stitch through any of the fronts where I don't want to and make sure that I'm keeping all of these lining fabrics which have a tendency to stretch a little bit on areas that are curved and bias cut. So this makes sure that everything is really precise more so than pins would in my opinion but you can just pin all of these layers together if you really want to do that as well. Once everything is turned right side out, I then can go and stitch the two fronts together up at that neckline with the center back seam with the collar, just like before. And everything that's turned gets clipped and pressed as need be. So the last thing I have to deal with with this back section is that collar area. This is a little bit unusual in the fact that the lining and the back sort of sandwich everything together and hold that folded collar portion of the lapel down. So it becomes permanently encased and can't unfold or flip back up again. So it's a little weird, but it works very well to keep this style, which has a permanent lapel, folded down. And that just gets felled for the lining and the back to that collar. I still have to stitch the buckle on, which is just the ends folded twice over the one rung of this buckle. You might have a different style of buckle depending on whether you get an antique or reproduction or one of the more modern options that's out there. But either way, it just needs to be attached and the other end folded over twice and fell down as well. So that way it's finished off. And then it's just the buttons and buttonholes. Same as before, keyhole buttonholes, and in this case, the button shanks just get stitched down. They don't get embedded or put through any eyelets. Because this is a fairly thick wool with all of the different layers in it, it doesn't need these things embedded in order to keep them nice and flat. 